Well, here we see Terry Griffiths playing some of the shots which must be the stock in trade of every professional snooker player. In order to get to this very high standard, of course, Terry has had to do a tremendous amount of practice. Practice in the department of the game that I like to call the ABC of the game. How to hold the cue correctly. How to stand correctly. Deliver the shot nice and straight and perfectly in balance. Anyone, in fact, can do this. And that is the whole idea of this program, to help you to become just that couple of blacks better than you are at the moment in order to beat that pal of yours at the club. These basic techniques of the game are going to be demonstrated by Terry, who, as you probably know, was the world professional snooker champion and has gone on since then to achieve just about every major success in the world of professional snooker. Well, I find, Terry, and I expect your experience will be very much the same, that whenever I'm in a club, I get asked by quite ordinary players how to play this or that extremely difficult shot. These yeah. seems to be the ones that they all want to try and bring off. They don't seem to appreciate that a few hours spent on the basic techniques of the game will pay far greater dividends. That's right. They never seem to ask the simple things. Like you say, the basics of the game, they always want to know about the spectacular strokes. Not those simple little things, like I just rolled the white up there behind the green ball to snooker my opponent. Now that's a difficult shot, but most players think that's easy. But it's not really, unless you've got the basics correct and strike the white dead center, strength of the stroke as well has got to be correct. They never do the stroke, and they always like to do, like you say, these very difficult shots and ask you these funny questions all the time. <laughs> I think they try to impress us, really, that they know a bit about the game, when really they haven't started off correctly, so they've got a long way to go. Well, I think then that we are agreed that we cannot, in this particular program, emphasize too much that it's the hours of practice on the basic principles of the game that's going to pay the greater difference. Oh, yes, very true. Well, let us then start them right at the beginning. Let's talk about cues. Now, it's an accepted fact that if you're going to play snooker regularly, it's far better to have one's own cue. Then you're using the same thing all the time. You get used to it and you get happy with it. As long as it's reasonably straight and it's got a good tip and there's the weight that suits you, that's just about all that is really necessary. Tell us a little bit about your cue. Well, my cue is very old, and it is important that, as you can see, it becomes an extension of your arm. Its weight, well, is 16 ounces, which seems a very popular weight these days. And, well, mine's dead straight. It's kept perfectly straight over the years. Well, you're probably a bit fortunate there, because, as you will know, most cues do develop a little bit of a kink in them, but that's mm. not terribly important, is it? Because you're only looking at the last couple of inches of it when you're playing your shot. You're not sighting along it as one sights along a rifle. So that doesn't really matter a great deal. But of course, the all-important thing is the business and the tip. As you can see, my tip is domed in shape because it has to strike the cue ball, obviously, which is round. And it's got a brass sphere there which supports the wood underneath the tip. And well, of course, the care of the tip is most important. Uh, we have yeah. a cue down there with a new tip on it, actually. Perhaps you'd like to bring that up and show us just exactly what you would do to put that tip into proper shape. Well, if you compare that to my tip, as you can see, it's flat on top and mine's a dome chip. So what you'll need then is just a bit of rough sandpaper. Bring it down like that, downward movement at a slight angle till it becomes more of a dome chip. Then what is a little tip, what you can do is just strike the cue, the tip of the cue like that with the white ball and that sort of bed will tip into shape then and keeps it, rather than knocking it in on the table, which takes quite a long time, you can just use the white ball and go along it like that. When it becomes round, and that helps a lot. Well, now, what about the actual chalking of the tip, Terry? I think you'll agree with me that the average player puts far too much chalk on. Oh, yes. The, always in the clubs, you see these club players playing, and it's four or five or even six strikes of the chalk across the tip, and it's far too much. And then if you just... Top the tip, you can see the chalk coming off. 
And that, of course, is as soon as you strike the cue ball, drops onto the bed of the table. That's no good at all. Little and often, I think, is the best. Well, of course, there was a humorist on one occasion, Terry, who maintained that the difference between the amateur and the professional player lied in the fact that the professional chokes his cue before he miscues. <laughs> well, one of the main reasons for miscuing is excess chalk in. You get a compressed layer of chalk across the top there, becomes very hard and very shiny. And to offset that, you need a little file and just put it on flat like that on top of the tip, swivel your cue around. As you can see, the tip now has become very rough on top and it gives you much better bite then on the cue ball when you strike it. To summarise then, it's best to own your own cue. The weight, well, that varies a little. 16, 16 and a half or 17 ounces seem to be the favourites. Tip nicely rounded and avoid excessive chalking. A little and often is the thing to remember. Well, the next thing we have to talk about then, Terry, I suppose, is, is the grip. That's obviously very important. Yes, of course. Well, you can see the cue on the table and you just pick it up like you would a hammer or any, any object like that and you hold it there, not too, uh, not too firmly, not too light. It's quite straightforward. Yes, you, you, you want a, a firm grip, but, but you wouldn't want to grip it tightly, otherwise you'd set up tension in your muscles, right, which yes. obviously you don't want. You want to be relaxed with that. You want the tension in the other, the other arm and relax in the cue arm, back arm. Well, having got the cue nice and firmly held in the palm of the hand, the obvious next step, get into position to play the actual shot. That's right, yes. That's uh, not as easy as it seems. First of all, of course, you have to line up through your eyes the two balls, the cue ball and the object ball. Then you have to start setting your feet in the correct position. And when I go down, I line up first of all, and then I can see my left leg is bent at the knee there. My foot is pointing in the direction of the, uh, the actual shot where the object ball is going. And my back leg, my right leg, is dead straight, pointing over that angle. That gives me a very solid base. I've always thought, Terry, that the, the stance at snooker is, is very similar to a boxing stance for precisely the same reason. Because yes. the body must be perfectly balanced. You know, when you're boxing, you want to be able to dodge and weave about. And keep yes, it, it's keep, just, yeah, it's you've just got to have your weight way. evenly distributed. So if mm. your feet are nicely apart and then you bend over, you come into that straight leg yeah, right position, that's right. bent left leg, then you'll stay perfectly still on that's the top, right. which is the essence of, of playing snooker. That's right, there's no movement at all. You can't uh, afford any movement, only in the arm. That's right, yeah. So, uh, well, my legs, you can see my legs there. I get up and do that again, back down to the stroke. As you can see, my back is slightly twisted over. Yeah, well, I suppose it's fair to say that you, you can't really be hard and fast about the way to stand at snooker because a, a short, thick man is obviously going to stand a little differently yeah. from a tall, thin man. That's perfectly obvious. Yes, well, you know, it's never comfortable in this position when you're starting off to play the game because it's a very unusual position to, to get in unless you're a snooker player, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've, we've been doing it for years and it, we naturally yeah, so do it. Yes, we obviously take for granted and just go into the, the position, but... Mm. Uh, of course, if you stay perfectly still and get that back arm, it's the only thing that moves, and you should pot the ball there. What could we say then? Comfortably, going to be comfortably stood and balanced. Yes. And that seems to be the two salient mm -hmm. points, does it not? So the grip. Hold the cue firmly, but not too tightly. And the stance, well, that will vary according to your stature but be comfortable with the feet nicely spread, the essence being that the body is perfectly balanced. Well, of course, the other very important thing that we've only touched on lightly, I think we must go into a little more detail, is the actual bridge, the bridge hand, the left yes. hand, the one that's on the table. Yes, well, uh, well, to form the bridge, of course, first of all, you, again, the, the, it's the uh, line from your eyes through, the, through the, the V there, which is formed with the bridge, through the two balls, the cue ball and the object ball, into the pocket. So that's the first thing. You put it on the table there, and you just put your hand down. Then you spread your fingers slightly, pressure on the tips of the fingers, and of course the heel of your palm there. That's all where the pressure is. Then that's very steady. As you can see, the pressure is holding it very steady. Then the thumb comes up, forms the V, which allows your cue, of course, goes through there, 
It's just like a rest, really, only your fingers are making the same V shape as the rest. See, that's very steady. Now, there's no movement in that, any movement at all, and you've got a lot of problems because you won't strike the cue ball in the centre where you obviously aim in. Yes, your fingers seem to be a little bit of a different shape from mine, actually. So you say start off there with the hand flat. Yes. Spread the fingers, raise the knuckles slightly, but my fingers stay straight, whereas yours yes. are a bit Well, clear. Well, my fingers are locked in, then, because, as you can see. So I got, uh, and of course my hand is flatter on the bed, so to get the height between the, my thumb there and the finger, I've got to uh, compensate in some way to get some height into my cue action. So really, so you're playing under a distinct disadvantage. Well, there is a bit of a disadvantage. <laughs> I, I actually had to change my bridge in 1976. I yeah, used to play like, just like I started off there. I actually won tournaments playing like that. Won championships, amateur championships. And I used to play with my hand flat on the table, fingers closed, of course, the thumb up there. And that's the way I played for, well, from 14 years of age up until 1976, <laughs> when I was, what, 15 years of age, 16? <laughs> Whatever you well, like to you, say. You would have found it very difficult to play a follow-through shot. Because that's right, that. to put topspin on the ball, because I'm so, so low down there that when I got to strike up the top, as, I, as you can see, I got to just cock my thumb up and nothing else is happening. And to bring my, through, my cue through straight then was very difficult, so I had to alter my technique, mm. although I've been playing the game for many, many years. The emphasis then is again on firmness. Firmness. Cut yeah. out all movement. That's, That's right. The thing you do. You... So in order to recap then, Terry, it's hand flat on the table to start with, spread the fingers a little, raise the knuckles, put the thumb onto the forefinger, heel of the hand nice and tight on the bed of the cloth, the whole essence of the thing being firmness, rigidity. We don't want any movement whatsoever in that left hand. Well, we've broken things down, Terry, into the various component parts. We've seen the grip of the cue, the bridge, the stance. Uh, now let's try and put it all together and, oh. and, and show something of the actual cue action. Uh, Terry's nicely in position there now. The left arm stretched out as straight as one can possibly get it with comfort. Don't want any tension in that. The head beautifully straight over the top of the cue, and the right arm immediately above the cue as well, so that everything is dead in line with the cue. Then all that has to happen is movement from the elbow forwards and back. While this is going on, the sighting is taking place. When you're absolutely certain that you're aiming correctly, through with the shot. Well, here you see exactly the same picture of Terry, but this time from the rear view. And the point to notice is just a little movement of the forearm is going to take the cue forward and back in an absolutely straight line. Well, there we have a perfect picture of Terry in action. If one draws a line straight through the middle of the cue ball, through the center of the cue, through the center of the head, and continue it on through the right arm, everything perfectly in a straight line. Well, we tried to give you the basic principles of how to develop a nice straight cue action at this game. The next thing, of course, is plenty of practice to try and get that right arm traveling through nice and smoothly and straightly. And Terry's now going to give you one or two shots in order to get plenty of practice and to develop this cue action as straight as it's possible. Just a cue ball into the top corner pocket. Trying to remember everything that we've told you about keeping everything as still as possible on the shot, the cue going through as straight as possible. The only thing that moves is the lower arm below the elbow. Just waggle that to and fro and then straight through. No reason at all why the ball shouldn't disappear into the pocket. Gets progressively difficult, this, of course, as you go further across the table, because the angle into the pocket is a little more acute. But once you can knock six or seven balls in, as Terry's doing here, you'll already be progressing pretty well. Yes, it's a very useful exercise, John. All the techniques that's uh, needed in the game are put into use there, the line-up, the, the eyesight straight to the pocket, and the ball should win, of course. Well, having spent some time practicing that last exercise, and I must emphasize here again that it does take a great deal of time to develop a very good cue action at snooker, you may then Try this one, a little bit more difficult. Terry this time 
is going to play the cue ball from the brown spot up over the blue, pink and black spots to the top cushion and try to bring the cue ball back down over the spots again, finishing up by going over the brown spot. Obviously this shot has to be played by hitting the cue ball directly in the middle because of course any side that's put on the cue ball will make it come back from left to right. It has to be a very accurate shot, you have to go really through straight right up over the spots. Well, I think, John, the speed that I hit the white ball is a very, very gentle stroke. And when you're saying about striking the white ball on the side, if you try to strike the white ball very hard and play this, exactly the same shot, we'll just try it now and see what happens. Well, as you can see, I'm two or three inches off. And, this the line of the and you're not a bad player, player, are you? Well, what, what that really demonstrates is that the harder you try the ball, the in the middle of the white where you're actually aiming and when it hits the top cushion I've put side hit the side of the cable it's come of course the wrong angle I'm nowhere near the spot so I think <coughs> the, the lesson there is don't hit the, the cue ball hard unless it's absolutely, absolutely necessary, necessary. That's yes right. that's right and of course the speed the, the strength of shot again is, is a very important part of the game a nice little practice shot for that is just to strike the white once again up and down the spots and try and get your white ball as close as you can to what we call the bark line, which is across there. But just try that. That's a very difficult shot, that is. But with a lot of practice, you should get uh, closer and closer. Now, as soon as I've hit that, I know I've gone too slow, because I recognize the speed pretty early. But it's a very good practice stroke, because the strength yes, that you hit the white ball, of course, is very relative when you come to the spins. Because it was rather difficult there for you, because you were talking when you played the shot. <laughs> well, I do tend to talk a lot, yes. <laughs> But that, of course, is a point. You see, there's so much concentration in this game. To really get yes. things correctly, you've got to concentrate 100% on what you're doing. Yes. You can't really talk and play this game, can you, at the same time? Try that once again, just to see how close you can get to the ball plan. Now, that doesn't look to be too bad. A little strong this time. Oh, that's one way of doing it. <laughs> Almost got it, I think. After you've practiced that assiduously and you're getting somewhere with it, here is one that you might try, a very, very advanced one. Terry, this time, is going to play the cue ball onto the red, which is on the blue spot in the middle of the table, send it onto the top cushion and come back to kiss into the cue ball again. has to be a very, very accurate stroke. Well, I've hit that more or less perfect. As you can see, John, it's a very, very difficult stroke. The object, of course, is to stay dead in line, follow through with the cue. Every, all the basics we have been talking about have got to be exactly right to get that stroke. It's a very difficult shot to play, but a good exercise. In fact, even a player of your caliber to make any contact at all between the two balls is a very good shot. Oh, yeah, just a glancing blow on the way back is very difficult. But uh, if you can get that stroke, then you're... You're halfway along to be able to pot the few balls. You're queuing pretty well. Yes, that's right. Well, now we've come to the point which I suppose you've all been impatiently waiting for, when we're actually going to knock one or two balls into pockets. First of all, the probably the easiest shot on the table, the blue on its spot in the middle of the table with the cue ball directly behind it, a perfectly straight pot into the middle pocket. Now, if you've been practicing your cue action as much as we hope you have, it should be perfectly easy to get down and cue along that straight line into the blue to knock it into the middle. That shouldn't be too difficult. After that, we're going to take the cue ball down the table a little, and now this is a much more difficult shot. Now, here, sighting has to come into it. No longer is everything in a straight line. One has to judge now where to hit the blue in order to knock it into the pocket. In actual fact, it is the same point of contact as the perfectly straight pot. If one were to draw a line from the middle pocket, from the middle of the pocket, that is, straight through the blue, where the line comes out is the point of contact. In fact, 
for every position within a potable radius is exactly the same point of contact on the blue. In other words, the part of the blue that's farthest from the pocket. So the second shot we'll play will be an angle like that. And then we're going to take it a little further down the table to make a much more thin contact on it in order to pot it into the middle pocket. Terry is now going to demonstrate these three shots for you. First of all, the perfectly straight pot, and then the two rather more difficult ones from rather an acute angle. Right, there's three different strokes here demonstrated in the pot in angles. The first one is the easiest of all to line up because it's a straight line between cue ball, the object ball, and the pocket. So this is probably the easiest shot to line up on the table. Straight through with your cue, as long as you've got your basics correct, lined up correctly, and the ball should win the pocket. Where it becomes a little more difficult, especially for the beginner, it's when the ball is not in a direct line to the pocket, and this time it's what we'll call a three-quarter ball contact. And that's when the cue ball, when you look through the line, the cue ball strikes the object ball, this time the brown, three-quarters way along the ball to make it go into the middle pocket. Now, of course, to recognize the actual pot and angle is the most difficult thing at this stage of the game, and that just comes through continuous practice and memorizing where you've struck the ball correctly or incorrectly the stroke before. We'll just try this one then. Three-quarter ball this time. Nice and sweetly into the pocket. This time we're a bit more difficult again. This time it's about half, halfway along the ball, what we would call a half ball pot. The white ball, taken through an imaginary line there, strikes the yellow ball halfway along, which will give it the necessary angle to go in the middle pocket. Nicely in again. We'll just go through those three shots again. Very useful to practice these, to learn your potting angles. Starting off then, straight into the middle. Second one, about three-quarter way along, the object ball. And the third and most, most difficult of the three strokes, because you haven't got so much of the object ball to aim for, about halfway along. The most important thing is, of course, if you do, do not get the, the object ball into the pocket, is to memorize where you've gone wrong, and the next time, possibly, you'll get the ball right and then keep it in your memory banks and you should be able to pot more consistently in the future. Let us make sure then that we understand completely what is meant by a half ball contact and a three quarter ball contact. If the tip of the cue strikes the middle of the cue ball and is pointing straight at the edge of the object ball, obviously when the two balls come together, the cue ball will be covering half the object ball and the three-quarter ball contact is, of course, when the cue ball appears to cover three-quarters of the object ball on contact. Well, hopefully by this time, if you've been practicing as hard as we are at a stage where you can pot some balls, and probably realizing by this time how very, very difficult this game of snooker is. Please don't be disappointed if on the odd occasions things just don't go as they're intended because this happens to every player, even the professionals. One has to just keep practicing, plugging away, and gradually things do start to improve and it's a great joy when you can make a decent break at the game. In order to achieve this, of course, one has to learn something about cue ball control, positioning the cue ball in exactly the right position for the next shot. Obviously, the only way one can make a break is to string several pots together. And one has to learn how to put various things into the cue ball to alter its natural power. Side, stun, screw, follow through, the right judgment of strength. All this can help you to achieve the desired position. We're now going to try and show you one or two basic shots which I think will help you to improve this side of your game. 
the cue ball, the only ball of the 22 balls in snooker that is engaged in every shot. So obviously a very important ball. All sorts of things can be achieved by striking it in various parts of it. Let us think of it as a clock. 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 6 o'clock. If we strike the cue ball at 12 o'clock, an excessive amount of topspin, which gets an exaggerated follow-through with the shot, very important, but not too often, but sometimes it's very important to do this with the cue ball. 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock, right-hand side, left-hand side, very important sometimes to alter the path of the cue ball after striking a cushion. And probably the most important, six o'clock, stun and screw. Probably 75% of shots at snooker, the cue ball is struck at the bottom, six o'clock. Stun and screw, most important. Let us try and give you one or two examples of what can be achieved by striking the ball at six o'clock. The first shot we're going to talk about is the stun shot. And the stun shot is when the cue ball strikes the object ball and the cue ball stops dead on impact. Now the technique required to play the stun shot, you go down and put the bridge on the table again, very solid, and to keep the, the cue as parallel as possible to the bed of the table, you slightly, you see my fingers going forward there, that drops the cue down, and we end up in that position. You're certainly not supposed to start from the centre again and lift the back of your cue to get the tip going, digging down into the white. That's the thing you mustn't do. So as you can see, in just below the centre there, just above six o'clock on the clock, this is the only stroke on the table when you, there's no follow-through at all required with your cue. As the tip strikes the cue ball, your cue stops dead, and that gives the effect then when the white ball strikes the red ball of the stun. So there it is, my bridge hand just dropped down slightly. The cue must stay as parallel as possible to the table. Just to demonstrate here how the cue stops dead after striking the cue ball. Well, the next stroke we're going to demonstrate is the stun run through. That's when the cue ball strikes the object ball, stops for a fraction of a second, and then runs on. The technique, again, very similar to the last two strokes. Middle of the white, starting off with the middle of the white, just below centre, drop in again, the bridge hand dropping down. This shot is very similar to the sun shot, though instead of stopping your cue as soon as it hits the white ball, this time the cue must go straight through after the white, which makes the white just spin on a little bit. Once again, reverting back to the clock, just above six o'clock. Right, the next shot is the screw shot. Now, the same technique as before, very similar, this stroke to the stun shot. You start off in the middle of the white ball. Now then, to get your cue, the tip of your cue, down to the bottom, extreme bottom, six o'clock on the clock. As you can see there, my bridge hand right down, keeping the cue as parallel as possible at all times in all strokes you play. Now, the main difference between the screw shot and the stun shot, the cue this time must go straight through the white ball follow through with the action, and then the white ball should spin back towards us. Just demonstrate that shot. Once again, you're going to drop right down with the tip to the bottom of the ball. Right, this time the top spin, 12 o'clock on the cue ball. Once again, down to the stroke, centre of the white. Now this time you need to go higher up on the cue ball to get the, the ball spinning. Once you set the object ball, is spinning forward so that it'll pick up speed after striking the object ball. So starting from the middle again, this time the bridge hand 
can see the bridge on curling up there. Q parallel. Once again, very essential. Follow through, right through with the Q. To just demonstrate this stroke. They are nicely in position again. Well, just to recap on the position of the tip of the cue, on the cue ball for those three shots. First of all, of course, was the stun shot, and that is just below center, from the center there, drop down, just below center. Second shot, the screw back, this time six o'clock on your clock, right down the bottom of the cue ball, don't forget the follow through of the cue. Third stroke is the top spin. This time from the center of the white. Raise your bridge hand up, keeping the cue parallel as possible again. And once again, after striking the cue ball, straight through with the cue, follow through all the way. Well, the last two spins that we impart onto the cue ball then, on the clock, of course, three o'clock and nine o'clock. Well, as you see, we've got the white ball lined up along the balk line here. We're going to strike the ball. If you're at the center of the white ball, you'll go along the balk line, come back in a straight line. If you're going to use the spins that we're talking about, side spin, three o'clock, right-hand side of the white ball. The cue ball should go along the balk line and come off on the right-hand side. Left hand side this time, nine o'clock on the clock. Not forgetting all the time, keep your cue straight, everything else in position correct. Left hand side, nine o'clock, along the balk line, comes off to the left hand side. Three o'clock this time then. Extreme left of the ball, center of the, of the the white ball on the extreme left, along the balk line again. This time the white, of course, coming off in the opposite angle. Here then are some practice shots for the stun, screw, and top spin or follow through shots. Firstly, the stun. Now the screw, bringing the cue ball back. And lastly, with top spin, the follow through. Once again, the same three shots, but this time a little more difficult because of their greater range, the stun. And this time the screw shot, bringing the cue ball back. Don't worry if you don't get it into the pocket as Terry does. And lastly, with excessive top spin, the run through. Let us now have a look at Terry playing one or two of these shots, certain positions where little stun, little screw, little follow through can bring the cue ball into the desired position. Well, here's one particular shot where we can use the various degrees of spin on the cue ball to get position for the next shot, and this time, of course, the colored balls. And uh, this time we're going to, first of all, play the stun shot, which we've spoken about earlier on, stop in the white ball, dead when it hits the object ball, the red ball, and that will give us, of course, position for the pink ball into the corner pocket. We can also play from, again, this uh, straight shot, screw back right on the bottom of the white ball, pot in the red again into the corner pocket, and this time bringing the ball, the white ball, right back up here, this time we'll have the blue ball into the center pocket. The other option is the stun run through shot, which again we've spoken about earlier on. This time the white ball the red ball into the pocket, and the white ball this time following through to pot the black ball into the corner pocket over there. We'll just demonstrate those few shots. First of all, the stun shot. Stop the white still to pot the pink over into the right-hand corner pocket. Nicely on the pink here.
this time then the screw shot. Pull the pull in the cue ball back for position on the blue ball into the centre pocket. Just come nice there, leaving myself a nice simple blue into the middle. This time the stun runs through shot, striking the white ball onto the red ball, taking the white ball through about 18 inches for position to pot the black ball into the corner pocket. And this time, nicely on the black. Well, this time, another stun shot. Leave my white there, ready to pot the black into the opposite corner pocket. This time, then, the top spin taking the white ball off the side, bottom cushion, side cushion, and back around again for the black. Well, from this position, it'd be very difficult to get onto the pink or the black ball after potting the red. So the screw back shot here, right on the bottom of the white ball, bringing it back down here to pot the blue into the center pocket. Run through shot, pot in the object ball into the corner pocket, the cue ball off the top cushion there and back out for position on the black into the same pocket. Well, this time the black ball won't go into the far corner pocket because there's a red ball obstructing its past there. So it's going to be top spin this time on the white ball, taking it pot the red into the corner pocket, the white ball off the bottom cushion there, up this time for position to pot the black in the opposite corner pocket. They are nicely in position again. Well, this time, you can try and pot the red ball into the corner pocket. It would be straightforward enough just to play a stun shot to stop the white there and pot the black ball into the corner pocket, but of course there's a red ball in the way of the black, so what we're going to play now is the screw back shot, right down the bottom of the white ball, pop the red into the corner pocket, and bring the white ball back for position on the black into the same pocket. Right on the bottom again, six o'clock. Brings the white ball back nicely on the black. Well, this time, the use of side spin. Three o'clock and nine o'clock on the white ball. Now, we don't recommend using side unless it's, it is necessary because it makes the stroke a lot more difficult. But here's a typical example. You're gonna try and pop the red ball into the corner pocket there. Now, if you were to strike the, the cue ball into the center, what would happen, the white ball would come off the side cushion and come up and knock the colored balls there out of the way. So you've lost your position. So what you've got to do in this position is use side, right hand side, which is three o'clock on the white ball, takes the white ball off the side cushion there, up here, trying to pot the blue position, get position for the blue into the center pocket. First of all, we'll just demonstrate what would happen if you played center, center of the white ball. The white ball would strike the red, red goes into the corner pocket, the white ball will come up and kiss the, probably the green ball along the balk line there. Well, we demonstrated what happens there if you strike the white ball 
in the center, it comes off and kiss the green ball. And of course, there's a red ball there that stops me putting stun or screw on the white ball to widen the angle. Of course, we are trying to get position for the blue into the center pocket. So we've got to use side for this stroke. This time it's right hand side, three o'clock on the clock. Taking the, the white ball then off the side cushion and up right hand side takes it out of the very wide arc to get position for the blue into the center. There we are, it's quite good for the blue. Well, so far we've shown quite a lot of straight pots. The ideal position to find yourself in, after potting a red ball, is a slightly angled pot, about half ball this time. But if you, of course, if you're straight, if your pot is dead straight, <coughs> your cue ball, an object ball, and a straight line to the pocket, very much restricts what you can do with the cue ball. And of course, then you can't position for the next shot to continue your break. But at an angle, I'll just demonstrate a few of, the, few of these shots now for you. At an angle, with the use of stun, stun run through, screw back, top spin, all the spins we already talked about, you can put, place your white ball anywhere, really, on any part of the table. Just to demonstrate that, this time you're going to play stun quite a lot of power into this stroke, just below center, dead center of the white strike in, up the center line, bring the white ball right up to the top of the table. The cue ball can of course follow many different paths after a pot, and knowing the basic ones can put you on target for the next ball. Now, this is a simple pot into the corner pocket, and if it is struck plain ball, no side, screw, or anything on it at all, its path will be like this, the cue ball coming off the cushion, exactly the same angle that it went on. Now to get a narrower angle, a little right hand side has to be used, and this will bring the cue ball back into position too. And then of course, if a wider angle is desired, left hand side is used, and the cue ball then comes off the cushion, in the direction of number three. And then, of course, with varying degrees of side and screw, the cue ball can be placed almost anywhere on the table that one desires. Well, one or two examples there from Terry as to how the cue ball may be coaxed into an advantageous position for the next shot. A variety of situations, of course, always presenting themselves at snooker, this, I think, probably is one of the fascinations of the game, the fact that it is an ever-changing scene, no pattern to it, every frame entirely different from the one before. There are, of course, situations that constantly recur, and one of these is when just the six colors remain at the end of a frame. Very often in professional play, particularly, they are all on their spots, or at least very close to them, and in fact, most of the professional players practice this situation quite assiduously, because, of course, it can be very important into winning or losing a frame. Terry is now going to demonstrate his method of, of potting the yellow, green, brown, blue, pink, black. So let's just see how he gets on with it. Well, a nice little stun shot there, sending the cue ball onto the side cushion, perfectly on the green. Now we'll want to screw back just two or three inches to get onto the brown. And a nice straight brown into the bottom left hand pocket. Again, a little stun shot onto the side cushion to come up for the blue. And once again, perfect position. The cue ball just below the line of the middle pocket. Just trundle this blue in and run through onto the pink. And once again, absolutely perfect position, a little stun shot again to get the cue ball onto the black. And perfect position. Looks so easy, doesn't it? The first break-off shot that I'm going to demonstrate is quite an easy shot to play, a much more difficult one coming afterwards. And this time you're going to strike the cue ball dead center, no side, no, no spins at all, 
aim at the object ball, which this time is the last red of the triangle there. We're going to hit it halfway along the red ball, and the cue ball will then come off the bottom cushion, side cushion, and back down here towards the ball cushion. That's the place we're aiming to get to. Of course, one of the difficulties with that is that if the cue ball comes along there, it could strike either of the three colored balls there along the balk line and leave my opponent quite an easy red ball into one of the top pockets. We'll just give that shot a try. Well, I've struck the green ball there, and of course it's left my opponent now a possible pot with the, the object ball, the red there, into the corner pocket. So that, of course, is not a very effective break-off, but a lot easier than the second one that I'm now going to show you. What we're going to do this time then, striking the cue ball on the right-hand side at 3 o'clock on the clock, white ball into the second red on the triangle there, and on the right-hand side that I'm putting on the white, we'll come off the top cushion, swing it off the side cushion there, down onto this cushion, down past the ball colours, onto the bottom cushion. Of course, the advantage of that stroke is it cuts out any chance of the cue ball catching one of the ball colours that you see here and leaving my opponent with a nice easy shot. You've got to try and get the cue ball as close as we can to the bottom cushion. Well, as you can see, the cue ball is landing very close to the ball cushion this time. And while I have left my opponent a long shot to red into the corner pocket, it's very difficult because the white ball is so close here to the ball cushion. And, of course, we didn't come anywhere near those ball colours, and that's the reason why the white has landed up so close to the cushion. Well, most of the shots that we've played so far have been from pretty easy positions. We've been able to get the bridge hand nicely on the table and no great problem in playing the shots. But we must remember there's some very awkward situations that can arise while you're playing snooker. For instance, the cue ball can be tight underneath the cushion so that only the top of it can be struck with the tip of the cue. Very difficult situation. No player likes to be in that situation at all. Cueing over the top of a ball is also extremely difficult. Then there's using the rest and the spider and the stuff that most people call the long stuff, the long cue and rest. All these things present their own difficulties, so we thought we'd spend a few minutes showing you the best way to tackle this sort of situation. Well, we start off with one of the most difficult of all the strokes to play in the game. It's when the cue ball is tucked right under the bottom cushion here, which gives you very little to aim at. Only about a quarter of the white ball show in. Another difficulty with this, of course, is so close to the cushion that when you go down to play the stroke, your bridge hand is very close to the cue ball, restricts your cue coming back and forth. Also, of course, all your weight is on the front arm here, not so stable as you would normally be if you could get your bridge hand onto the bed of the table. My back hand comes back down the length of the cue, it's about a foot now from the end, because we're out of balance. My weight is now more onto my front hand, on the palm of my hand here, on the side cushion. Nothing adventurous in this shot. If you can hit the object ball, then you've done a very good stroke. If you pot it, it's a miracle. Well, this time, we can't reach the cue ball. It's right at the top of the table there, so we need the rest. Of course, you could you cannot jump onto the table because once your two feet leave the floor, then that's a foul shot. So what you do, you pick, put the rest in line with the cue ball and the black ball there. There's two ways of using the rest. The higher way there, or the lower way, which I prefer myself. So you've lined the shot up through your, straight through your eyes again, same line up as you would on a normal shot. Put the rest over there, keeping the rest very steady once again on the bed of the table because the rest actually is just an extension of your left arm and the V is formed up the top there. Now, as you can see, my cue, I, the grip on the back of my cue is quite different from what it would be for a normal stroke. I've got my two fingers over the top there, thumb underneath, very light, very light grip this time. Now, as you can see, my, my right arm this time 
is off the table about four or five inches. It's not quite so steady as it would be when you're playing a normal stroke. As you can see, it's a sideways movement. What you must try and do is keep the, the arm there from the elbow down to the wrist as parallel as possible, once again, with the bed of the table. So once again, nothing adventurous to this shot. All these shots are the same, very difficult shots to play. Bring the cue through nice and straight through the line of your eyes and drop the black, hopefully, into the bottom pocket. Well, the next shot, the white ball, as you can see, is in between the green and the brown there. And we're going to try and pot the brown ball in the centre pocket. Of course, the problem is you can't just put your bridge hand down as normal. The green ball is in the way. So this time, bridge add onto the table. All the weight on the tips of the fingers. Toes up to the toes of your feet. The back arm, as you can see, raised right up in the air. Not a very steady not a very steady stance at all this time, but nothing you can do about it. Same principle again. The, the aim of the stroke, straight through the cue ball, object ball, into the pocket. Never hit the ball hard in this position because you're not very steady. Your stance is not very steady at all. Thank you. 